Um, okay. When we think about the weapons used during World War II, most of us would initially think of those used on the battlefield, but governments had other weapons that became part of the war away from the battlefield. During 1942 and 1943, shackles became the political weapon of choice used behind the lines in prisoner of war camps. The use of shackles in prisoner of war camps in the European theatre became the most well-known incident of reprisals during the war, known as the shackling crisis. Next slide, please. Throughout the Second World War, the management of prisoners was a complex issue. Governments used reprisals against prisoners to manipulate the behaviour of enemy governments. This paper will explain the shackling of prisoners of war by belligerent governments and the use of this method of mass reprisal as an unusual form of weapon. This, this paper forms part of my research for a chapter of my thesis that discusses the shackling of prisoners of war, the use of reprisals as a political weapon, and the lengths governments would go to to gain the upper hand over the enemy outside the field of battle. My research explores the shackling of prisoners of war from an Australian government perspective, as the Australian government sought to adopt a different response to the reprisal issue from those pursued by British authorities. To do that, I look at the Australian, British and Canadian archives that reveal the Australian government communication between Britain and the other dominions and the response of each government's war cabinet. This then highlights the problems between the British and Dominion governments regarding international conventions, POW policy and how POWs were managed. Next slide, please. At no other time throughout the war was the issue of reciprocity as vital as it was in the case of the Shackling crisis. Belligerents expected reciprocity in all aspects of POW treatment, even if it meant resorting to reprisals to get it. The reprisals were banned under Article 2 of the 1929 Prisoner of War Convention. They were still used to ensure adequate treatment of prisoners. More importantly, reprisals were used to curve belligerent behaviour in the general war effort. To Churchill, the prospect of crossing swords with the Fuhrer was greeted with great enthusiasm. Berlin had a catalogue of complaints about British conduct on the battlefield in Libya and at Dieppe. And along with the threat that British commandos were to be treated as bandits, merely proved that Hitler was determined to use prisoners to force Britain into scaling down its military activities and force Britain into a kind of conventional war in which Germany had the upper hand. Next slide, please. In August 1942, events on the battlefield would directly affect the treatment of POWs. The Germans considered the raid at Dieppe on the 19th of August to be a violation of the rules because captured Germans were immediately handcuffed. The Germans protested, wanting to end the practice. They announced that though they believed the British had not intended to leave the handcuffs on, they would still handcuff British and Canadian prisoners detained in German prison camps. The British replied that they would do the same to German prisoners, arguing that what had happened at Dieppe had been due to exceptional circumstances. Drawn into, this, into the dispute under Article 87 of the Geneva Convention, the International Committee of the Red Cross sent telegrams to both sides, reminding them of their guarantees over prisoners' humane and chivalrous treatment. However, in a statement to the House of Commons on the 13th of October 1942, Churchill announced, the Geneva Convention upon the Treatment of Prisoners of War does not attempt to regulate what happens in the actual fighting. It is confined solely to the treatment of prisoners who have been securely captured and are in responsible charge of the hostile government. Both His Majesty's government and the German government are bound by this convention. The German government, by throwing into chains 1,370 British prisoners of war for whose proper treatment they are responsible, have violated Article 2 of the aforesaid convention. They are thus attempting to use prisons of war as if they were hostages, upon whom reprisals can be taken for occurrences on the field of battle with which the said prisoners can have had nothing to do. This action of the German government affronts the sanctity of the Geneva Convention, which His Majesty's government have always been anxious to observe punctiliously. The day before Churchill gave his speech to Parliament, he met with his cabinet, where he declared to his colleagues, Dominions are soft. If we are to defeat, defeat this ill treatment of prisoners, they will be, sorry, if we are to defeat, are defeated on this ill treatment of prisoners, they will be used as blackmail tactics. 
Therefore, when the Cabinet convened the day before to, to prepare a public statement for the House of Commons, the, mo the mood was quietly confident. The ministers saw the advantage of playing the long game with the Lord Privy Seal, Sir Stafford Cripps, responding, it will go on until both sides are bored. While, opin while opinion at home and in the dominions had already shown itself to be critical, the British War Cabinet records suggest that the shackling crisis was a test of wills to be endured. As a result, it would be another seven weeks before the Cabinet finally gave in and agreed to seek a solution to the crisis through Swiss channels. But before that decision, the pressure to alter its policy became intense. Meanwhile, in Germany, the Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop discovered that the main Axis partners were reluctant to support further action. By the second week in October, Ribbentrop had contacted the German ambassador at Rome about the possibility of a joint Axis policy on the shackling issue. The idea was to make the British concede defeat when faced with the general threat to prisoners of war in Axis hands and allow Germany to declare a moral victory. Unfortunately for Germany, the Italian government saw things differently. With 260,000 Italian prisoners detained by Britain and the Allies and far few British, British prisoners in Allied hands, Italy would be at the distinct disadvantage if involved in reprisals. As a result, the German ambassador was informed that Italy would be able to do nothing. London, however, did not tell Canberra about Berlin's efforts to persuade Tokyo to adopt shackling measures. Next slide, please. While Germany failed to gather additional support for the reprisal action, Churchill also attempted to gain support to win the reprisal war with Germany. He would need the involvement of the Dominions. The British War Cabinet also was slow to acknowledge the Dominion sensitivity over the fate of their prisoners and Britain's insistence on relying on collaborative arrangements that were now considered not fit for purpose nearly came unstuck in 1942. While most Dominion politicians were comfortable making Britain's cause their own in September 1939, few doubted that wartime relations with Britain would be smooth. The chaining of prisoners in 1942-43 placed great strain on the common unity approach usually shown by Britain and the Dominions through the Imperial Prisons of War Committee. Established early in the war to present a united front in talks with Axis authorities about matters concerning POWs. This led to a split in Allied support over the period of the dispute, which caused considerable misery and suffering for the POWs involved. The United States publicly dis disassociated itself from British reprisals, while, in the, while at the same time, Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King privately made it clear they were not willing to risk any further the welfare of Commonwealth prisoners. In his diary of the 10th of October, 1942, King notes, the Germans are now threatening to retaliate three to one, received an important wire from England, urging us to adopt additional measures. The British have bungled the whole business terribly, trying to conceal certain orders given at the time of the Dieppe reconnaissance, which they could not conceal because known to the Germans. Instead of repudiating the orders, they have made matters worse by deception concerning them. The whole business is very involved and full of very dangerous possibilities. Later in the day, King discussed the shackling situation with the Canadian War Cabinet. All present are unanimous in the view that we should not seek to compete with the German in their brutalities. Also, that we should ask Britain to seek mediation of protecting powers and Red Cross to end what has taken place. We agree not to attempt any three to one fettering as an unwise policy of retaliation and one which the allies were certain to get the worst end of. But above all, to give time to ascertain what the real motives of the Germans were. Churchill clearly misjudged the mood in the dominions regarding how far they were willing to, willing to present a united front when the humane treatment of their fellow countrymen in captivity was at risk. London's refusal to consult or even forewarn the dominions before committing them to a policy of reprisals undoubtedly annoyed. But the impact on the dominions own international interests ultimately made the issue divisive for Britain's imperial relations. Next slide, please. The Australian government watched the negotiations from the outset of the Shackling crisis. In October 1942, 
the Australian government laid out its concerns regarding the issue of reprisal action taken by the British government. A cable from the Australian Prime Minister's Department to the Dominion Office in London addressed the issue. The matter is one of such general concern, a potential danger to a large number of Australians now in the hands of the Japanese, that we would have preferred being advised at a much earlier stage. We have little faith in the value of reprisals, especially in the case where the burden falls on helpless captives on both sides and where competition in cruelty can be carried on indefinitely with far more embarrassment to us than to the enemy. Nevertheless, we are gravely concerned about the consequences to prisoners held by the Japanese. There seems to be a valid distinction between prisoners detained during the actual progress of operations and those who are in secure custody. The validity of the distinction is clearly in dispute between belligerents within the meaning of Article 87 of the Convention. Therefore, a conference should be suggested under Article 87, and the German government asked in the meantime to withdraw its order for the manacles of Dieppe prisoners. Before your decision is announced, we desire to be informed of it, also of the views of the other dominions, so that we can determine our position. Also wanting unity on the handcuffing order that started the whole affair, Britain suggested that Australia should also issue a similar order of shackling soldiers immediately after capture on the battlefield. The Australian government put the suggestion to General Blamey, the commander in chief of Australian military forces in early 1943. Blamey viewed it with concern as all Australian military operational forces had been withdrawn from the European and Middle Eastern theatres. Blamey believed the orders issued to the British Army did not apply to the Australian forces and should be regarded as one affecting only the European theatre of war. He wrote, I consider that the order issued to the British Army, no matter how secretly promulgated, if repeated in the Southwest Pacific theatre, be immediately grasped by the Japanese to cover up their atrocities committed in the past and provide them with propaganda and excuses for any sort of inhumane action to our prisons of war, which we know from past experiences, they have no hesitation in carrying out. Uh, next slide, please. Australian troops were not involved in the mission at Dieppe that caused the unusual form of retaliation. Therefore, the Australian government had no reason to think that they would be caught up in current events. But Australian POWs did suffer through the political reprisal in the first instant, it was applied to the Diet prisoners, but then extended to others. So initially, the Australian government was unaware that their soldiers were involved in the shackling reprisal. It was not until January 1943 that Australian censors started to see a pattern in letters that had been written to their families around October 1942. The contents of the letters had information that Australian prisoners were now included in the reprisal. For example, Lieutenant William Bates in Off Lag 7B wrote to his sister, at the present moment, things are a bit restricted, especially at the wrists. Don't tell mum or dad as they'll only worry, but I was caught up in the backlash of the Dieppe business. There's no harm in it, and it's really only boring. Lieutenant Anthony Older also of Off Lag 7B wrote, things at the moment have happened in the POW world. I am now one of the select band in what are popularly called shackles, otherwise handcuffs, for 12 hours a day. And I can assure you it's a most interesting experience. He ends, the whole affair seems very childish. When it was discovered that Australian prisoners were amongst those shackled, Canberra began to look closer at the affair. Next slide, please. On 12th of December 1943, both the British and Canadian governments removed the handcuffs from their prisoners and never again put them on. The Germans, however, freed their bond, prisoners' bonds only on Christmas Day and New Year's Day, stipulating before rescinding the order that the British issue a general order prohibiting the binding of prisoners on the battlefield and the possession of bonds for that, for that purpose. Britain would not concede to a degree of entirely revoking the order allowing the binding of hands, stressing that such measures would be taken only in the case of operational requirement. The unspoken agreement to let the shackles die a natural death did not mean the end of Anglo-German friction over the treatment of prisoners of war. On the contrary, as the war grew more intense, the genuine desire to hit back against enemy captives did too. 
The Shackling crisis showed the length of tip-for-tat reprisals that belligerent governments were willing to go to to manipulate the enemy. And as belligerents started to dig their heels in and it seemed they were unable or unwilling to reach an agreement, the International Committee of the Red Cross and Protecting Powers were required to step in as neutral intermediaries. Shackles became a political weapon and a, a visual representation of a specific method of reprisal that was used to manipulate belligerents. This event is an excellent example of the power of reciprocity in the treatment of prisons of war, with the crisis serving as a warning on both sides about what could happen if the mutual hostage factor were ignored as the war continued. Thank you.